Welcome to Asian Pacific Voices Radio, where you'll find stimulating conversations that explore diverse topics and stories impacting our Asian Pacific American communities. I'm your host, Rasha Goel. Joining us today on the show is a remarkable Lao Isan American and cultural entrepreneur. Her deep connection to her Southeast Asian heritage has fueled her passion for sharing the rich cultures of Laos and the broader region. As the founder of Tuk Tuk Box, she's on a mission to curate and deliver unique experiences that unravel the traditions, flavors, and stories of Southeast Asia, fostering a deeper understanding and appreciation. It's my pleasure to welcome Christy Inuvang Thornton. Welcome to our show, Christy. Thank you, Rasha. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. You have such a fascinating background. So I'd love to talk a little bit about your upbringing. Now, you're Lao Isan American, and I understand that your parents are refugees from Laos and Isan, which is in northern Thailand. Uh, that is correct? Correct. All right. So what was it like for your, when your, for your parents and you when they immigrated to the U.S.? What was your life like growing up here? Well, I was born in Seattle, Washington. And my parents actually didn't meet until they were both in Seattle. Um, so my my mom is Isan from the Northeast region. And then my father is more from the South of Laos. And my I'm not sure if you're very familiar with the Secret War, but a lot of Lao families and Southeast Asian families had to flee after the Secret War in Laos, which is um, basically took place after the Vietnam War, where a bunch of U.S. bombies were dropped. Um, the most bombs per capita to the state were dropped on Laos for nine years straight. And so my parents fled uh, wow. during that time or right after. And my mom and her family um, had to chop down a tree trunk, a banana tree trunk, and float across the Mekong to get to safety. And so this was all before I was born and, um, and they hadn't met yet. And they actually met in the Mormon church because they were both sponsored by different Mormon families to come to America. And so I grew up in a very homogenous neighborhood, if you will, very white Christian suburbia and had no real connection to my Lao culture until much later in life. Interesting. And so is that what maybe inspired you then to kind of bring and share that culture more? Because you've created Tuk Tuk Box, which is the first and only Southeast Asian focused subscription box in the U.S. market. Um, tell me a little bit about what Tuk Tuk means, your inspiration behind it. Yes, definitely. Um, it was probably later in high school where I really had this like huge identity crises where I was like, where am I from? And, and being raised by these white sponsors of mine no real connection. And so at that point, I really tried to like dive deep into my own heritage and learn about my family and um, ended up after high school, moving to Bangkok, Thailand and visiting Laos and seeing where my family was from for the first time. And it was like, okay, I didn't have this connection before, but now I'm going to learn and do everything I can to preserve and honor um, and know my background. And so uh, the impetus for Tuk Tuk Box basically was a nonprofit that I started called Courageous Kitchen. And essentially, we do social impact and we do food education and intermediary services for other refugee families similar to mine. But during the pandemic, we had to close all of the business of programming, which um, our main bread and butter was like cooking classes and market tours. And so I was sending out these kind of curated snack boxes and cooking ingredients to friends during the pandemic that wanted to still be connected and learn about the food. And I was doing it for free. And so I kind of wow. just wow, <laughs> I can make a business out of this. Um, there aren't any other services that I know that were sending out Southeast Asian food products here in America. So that was the start of Tuk Tuk. And a tuk tuk. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but they have them all over, like a little auto rickshaw. Um, they have them in India. They have them all over Asia. Yes, they have different. I've names. ridden in them many times. <laughs> yeah. I love them, and they're so fun, and they're just iconic of what you think of Southeast Asia, or specifically to me, Thailand, because that's where I most connect. And 
Christy, what's been the responses from customers or people you know or what they've been experiencing with the Tuk Tuk Box? I think overall, amazing and just people feeling seen and heard. Um, a lot of times, Southeast Asia wasn't, I mean, still to this day, not represented in mainstream media or even in like the CPG world, which is um, consumer goods. Um, and so for people to say, I love reading about this Hmong family or um, some of the more remote places um, has really been like touching and people sharing their stories or recipes and saying, I didn't think that anybody would care about my food. So for example, we have sometimes in our boxes, we'll curate with like a homemade jam from some, from an auntie from Indonesia, right. Or a chili paste from, a farmer in Texas. And so these are all people from the Southeast Asian diaspora that are now living in the U.S. that didn't think that people outside of their own community or, or family would appreciate this. So we try to source um, different stories and recipes and product from the whole community. And are you finding the response also from people from different communities or right now, is it mostly Southeast Asian communities or or is it a larger diaspora than that? I would say it's pretty split. Um, and so, and it's all ages. So there's not really one demographic. People are buying for their grandchildren. We get, we get corporate orders. And so the response oh. has been awesome. And people saying like, we've never seen anything like this. Um, and, and I think the mission to like giving back to these asylum seeking families and all of the people that we hire a contract, you know, I'm like pretty strict about like 99.9% .9 of all of the people that I work with are from the diaspora. Um, okay. So it's also driving the economic development, um, teaching entrepreneurship and showing them that there's a real market for, uh, for their food and for their, for their product. I love that. What are some other recipes that you include and can people order these boxes? What's the website to go to? Yes. So the website is tuktukbox.com, T-U-K-T-U-K-B-O-X. Uh, we have probably at least 50 to 75 recipes online for free. And you can go to the website right now. We're not doing subscription boxes. We're just doing one-time boxes. So um, in the beginning, we started as a subscription-based model where every month, just like HelloFresh, you could get mm. can uh, snack boxes at your door. But now it's just a, a one-time box. We have different levels of funkiness, if you will. A lot of times growing up, we were shamed for our food. Um, yeah. People would say it was too smelly, too funky, too weird. And so yes. we are like, embrace the funk, embrace the curry, the fish, the shrimp paste, all of that. Um, so we have different funk levels where if you're like, I'm not quite sure what durian is or uh, don't really want to try chili squid yet, you can get the lowest tier, which is a little funky. And then we have funky fresh and then it goes all the way to funky. <laughs> I love the tears. <laughs> yes. and, and for anyone who's listening or watching right now, it is lunchtime. So talking about this is definitely making me hungry. <laughs> yeah, me um, too. Right? Talk to me a little bit more about Courageous Kitchen. It's a nonprofit, a 501 nonprofit organization. What, what's the mission and what are maybe some other programs that are offered? Sure. So we act as an intermediary, mostly we're based in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, but for those who don't know, there's a lot of families from non-neighboring countries still fleeing to Thailand today and seeking refuge. Um, this is because of war or persecution, usually religious persecution. And so when I went there, it was quite frustrating because of um, the systems that were in place to help these people were were quite corrupt and they weren't really doing what they said they were supposed to be doing, right? They were giving families expired food. Um, it, they, they can't go to school because Thailand doesn't recognize immigrants. And so families are fleeing to Thailand thinking they can receive safety and assistance. And that's not the case. So my friend Dwight and I, we essentially, he started um, by hosting parties and food festivals and pop-ups to raise money to support refugee families. And then I came along and 
started cooking with a lot of the families because the kids were always starving. Um, a lot of them, their families were digging in the trash for food. And so we, it, long story short, it, we turned it into a social impact and Airbnb approached us and said, would you like to teach on our platform? And so we started teaching cooking classes and market tours in order to raise money um, for the families. And so we didn't have to beg our friends for donations anymore and <laughs> didn't necessarily have to do these big productions. So that right. was our main program is like a, a nutrition education program, but we also do supplementary education. So depends on who we have as a volunteer. So it's English classes, might be yoga. Um, and then we do a lot of food rescue and food deliveries to the camps along the Thai Burma border. Right now we're helping with vaccinations and kind of PPE supplies, school supplies. So we kind of act as this intermediary agency for the families. Christy, what an incredible thing to be able to create. And I'm sure it hits home because of the personal experience, but I'm just listening to the 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 pathway that you're paving for so many families. I'm sure internally that must bring some type of joy for you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I like to say that uh, we are resilient, not because we want to be, because we've been forced to be. Um, and I, I look at these families and say that very well could have been my own parents, my own family living in a in the slums, you know, 12 people to a room digging through the trash. And so when I am discouraged or frustrated because I've, you know, created these businesses essentially with, with no funding, with no formal education and background to do nonprofit work. I, um, wow. I just think about these families and say, Hey, if they can do it, like I have nothing to complain about. So it, they help me more than I help them. Oh, that's, I, I just, I just think the work you're doing is so incredible. And, you know, sometimes we don't, you are able to see obviously an immediate response to, but I would just even be curious 10 years from now to even talk to one of those families, right? Or those kids, because this is definitely going to leave a lasting impact. And speaking of impact, you're also working on another campaign, Spread Asian Joy. What is that all about? Yes, I have my t-shirt here. Um, so this is something that we started actually, I guess, at the in response to the, the height of the anti-Asian rhetoric. Um, and attacks that were going on kind of during the pandemic in the last two years. Um, and I'm all about manifestation and visual, visual, visualization, excuse me. Um, me too. <laughs> but just really like the idea of thoughts become things, right? And so in seeing all of the stop Asian hate and being inund inundated with that negativity, we decided to kind of reframe that and flip it to the affirmative of spread Asian joy. And so centering our voices, our stories, um, our accomplishments versus sharing stories of trauma and sharing more attacks and uh, spreading more negativity. And so through this campaign, um, we were able to raise thousands of dollars and donate to various organizations throughout the U.S. and Southeast Asia, um, able to raise money for safety kits for the elderly, um, one for a woman's shelter. Um, they support Asian American women that have been in and out of domestic violence and like sex trafficking. And so we're very intentional about every single product um, is curated and touched by somebody from our diaspora, but also the impact go to specific organizations in the diaspora. So for example, we had another product that we did, um, a pho kit. And so it was a Vietnamese pho kit. Uh, we had a Vietnamese chef for that to create, to create the recipe. But then um, proceeds from that went to a Vietnamese organization in New Jersey. All right. So a lot of active work for you, a lot yes. of activism here. Yes. <laughs> what, you know, what advice would you give to other people like yourself who are in the entrepreneur world and um, they are passionate about sharing their culture and, and really making an impact on humanity, on other people? I, because I'm sure that this hasn't come 
easily as well? I'm sure there's been challenges or things you've had to deal with along the way. I would say don't go in it for the money. <laughs> um, <laughs> either one, right? Um, either nonprofit or entrepreneurship. I, I am a self-proclaimed hustler and humanitarian. So I've had to juggle multiple jobs, sometimes just random jobs, dog sitting, house sitting, meal prepping, nannying in order to fund my passions. And it's not just a nine to five being an entrepreneur. Sometimes it's a 24 uh, seven. You might understand that very well, but your ideation is your currency. And you don't, you don't know when the next paycheck is coming. Um, I've done the box for zero dollars for the last three years, just all because of my passion and because of the love of the community. Um, wow. And so from the outside, you know, whatever you're doing, people might think like, you know, all rainbows and butterflies, but realize like the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial journey can be really lonely, really difficult. And to surround yourself with mentors and people that challenge you and believe in that mission. And when you do get frustrated, just center yourself and go back to your why. It's not for money. It's not for cloud. It's not for anything but doing good and doing impact. Christy, this sounds like the artist life too. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm listening to you, what people in the entertainment industry go through too. <laughs> Except I do feel you have a larger impact in a, in a different way. But, you know, of course, in the media, we have it in a different way. I love what you said, though, to go back and ground yourself and yeah. ask the why. I think that is that is so pivotal um, in anything that we try to create when we have an, in when we're trying to make an impact. But I say, Christy, since you're a manifester and you like to visualize, we, we need to manifest an investor for you because you are just creating something so magical here um, that, again, really is setting up people across the world and here in the U.S., but for generations to come. And I, there's nothing more powerful in really impacting humanity like that. Where do you see Tuk Tuk Box in the next five to 10 years? What would, you, what would you like to see both in terms of business and cultural growth for it? Uh, definitely an investor because it's been 10 years of doing it without, uh, you know, me just kind of reaching for scraps. Um, I, my dream is to have a Southeast Asian farm here in the U.S. Um, my, my mom, her family, they're rice farmers, and I just want to get back to the land and to kind of teach those ancestral um, rituals that our people did, right? And then within that, to have a community space, to continue the cooking classes and nutrition education. Um, there are certain things like that we might think are rudimentary that are essential life skills for people that are new to maybe newly immigrated to the U S or families that have been really insular here. Mm -hmm. So there's many communities that still don't connect. They are still very siloed. You know, it's like the Lao communities here, Cambodian community here, Vietnamese community yes. here for different reasons. Right. Um, but I want like the central hub for them to be able to, to come together, to continue the education to continue uh, civic engagement, economic development. Um, so that's kind of big picture for Tuk Tuk. And then for me to, you know, help continue mentoring other young Southeast Asian women or people who are interested in entrepreneurship. Um, and then I'm writing a cookbook, which should be released in the spring. So please stay tuned and everybody purchase yes. it because a lot of the recipes are from the community. They're not just my recipes. I love that. Oh, I will be looking out for that. That's so exciting. You've got, you've got your hands full. Well, since you've got a cookbook coming out, I have to ask you this. Is there, what's your favorite dish that you had growing up or a dish that you'd like to share with us that maybe most people don't typically try? That's, I mean, I want to say that's so hard, but actually it's really easy. Um, it's very simple in the Lao community or in Lao families. It's sticky rice which mm. people have probably had with mango before. Yes. <laughs> as a dessert, but that's like a staple, just like, you know, how certain families eat roti every day. Mm -hmm. Allow people eat sticky rice every day. So my like comfort meal would be a, a sausage called saiua, which is a Lao, like lemongrass, 
lime leaf dill sausage. Mm. Uh, my mom makes a really good homemade one. That was sticky rice. It was like ultimate comfort, favorite, favorite meal. How interesting. I didn't even know that. And you're right. Like roti, at least for Indians, is a very staple Yes. Uh, staple food, roti and rice, but sticky rice had no idea. Well, every day <laughs> you <have laughs> you shared so many beautiful things with us today. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we go? Um, no, just thank you. You know, thank you for for sharing this platform and and reminding people that Asian Americans are not monolithic. Um, yeah. That we all have something to offer, and that our stories of joy and triumph and and our accomplishments should be normalized it should just be the mainstream right yeah, yeah so with you on that and we have such a large diaspora right so i think it's also understanding that too it's you just can't categorize everybody under under one listing it just doesn't work like that um yes. you know given given the diaspora itself where christy where can people find you on social media um at tuk tuk box on instagram is probably the easiest way or our website tuktukbox.com Great. And they can, again, people order the book, find out, well, the book when it's done, the box is what I meant to say, order a box, learn about some new recipes and more about what Christy's um, up to. And then of course, also the Spread Joy, Spread Asian Joy campaign too. I'm sure people would love to learn more about that. So Christy, it's been so much fun talking to you. Thank you for joining us today on Asian Thank Pacific you. Voices Radio. And for all of our listeners too, we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions, if you have any guests you'd like to recommend or even any topics you want us to talk about, please do reach out to us. And don't forget to subscribe to our program on your favorite podcast platform, as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter X, Instagram, and of course, our YouTube channel where you can watch all of our shows. Don't forget that Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance. We're a nonprofit that empowers the Asian Pacific American communities with a voice through media. Now, if you'd like to support our program or donate, please visit us at AsianPacificVoicesRadio.com. I'm Rasha Goel. Once again, thank you for joining us on Asian Pacific Voices Radio Podcast. I hope you enjoyed our show today. And don't forget to join us again next week for another thought-provoking conversation.